Hello, and thank you for watching this FOSS Backstage presentation on intellectual property and open source, otherwise known as a super practical overall guide to intellectual property for developers, contributors, and basically anyone curious about this incredibly esoteric topic for one reason or another. My name is Jim Jagelski, and I will be your guide in this journey where we discover some of the high-level topics of intellectual property and especially how they uh, intersect, uh, involve, and influence open source. And especially some of the considerations that as an open source developer or contributor or as someone who consumes open source needs to be concerned about as it relates to intellectual property. Now, I am a developer, but one important thing that you must know about me is... Crap promise number one, I am not a lawyer. That's correct, I am not a lawyer. This cannot in any way be construed as legal advice. I am a developer. I do have many decades of experience uh, being involved in open source, both from a contributor volunteer standpoint, as well as uh, being in and heading some open source program offices for various companies. And so this knowledge, this experience is gained by um, basically all those interactions and the knowledge that I've gleaned over the years regarding uh, intellectual property and open source. This is really a guide for it, but if you have any real questions, if you have any real concerns, if there are any areas about what I will be talking about, which um, you are curious about or you have questions about, don't use this as the definitive guide. Always seek a uh, valid legal counsel uh, as you uh, as you go through your journey if you have any questions about IP. Now, some people may wonder and ask uh, why intellectual property is even curious. Uh, uh, why is something to even be uh, concerned about? And there really is a lot of confusion on these particular topics in the open source community in certain areas. There's the idea that simply because something is available on GitHub, for example, uh, you can use it any way you want to. Uh, and that it is uh, by default because it's simply placed on GitHub open source. And that's really not the case. There are a lot of um, interactions and intersection points between intellectual property and open source. And some of these um, connection points can be somewhat difficult to understand. If you're using open source or sharing and distributing open source in an incorrect fashion, that could lead to significant uh, harm and risk to yourself, to the company, uh, including financial risk and reputational risk. So really having a basic understanding of open source and intellectual property is really critical to be able to gain the benefits that open source and open source projects and the open source development methodology provides to you. Now, as you said, we'll be talking about intellectual property and really there are four main ideas or tenets of intellectual property. Now, I will admit that most of this comes from a very uh, US-centric point of view. There may be some things which vary in your um, uh, legal location. Uh, again, that's another good reason why to make sure that if you have any serious questions, check with legal counsel, because there are some things that may change, may vary from one locale uh, to another. But in general, these are the four main types of intellectual property that, uh, that we'll be talking about and discussing. First of all is the concept of trade secrets. Now, these are, of course, the uh, best traditional example for this is the formula for Coca-Cola. That's uh, supposedly 
uh, written down and locked up in a vault someplace. These are uh, uh, ideas, thoughts, uh, secrets that are incredibly critical to the success and value of either a brand, a company, or a product. And these are, um, you know, watched and maintained very, very carefully. And so trade secrets are those things that really are critical for projects, critical for companies, and really cannot be shared because if they were to be shared, it would be detrimental to that project or company or product. Now, very similar to trade secrets are the ideas of patents. In some ways, you can think of patents as trade secrets, but with enough protection around them that you can publish or release those trade secrets without causing um, immediate harm or a detrimental effect to, uh, to whatever the effort is that you're associating it with. It's an opportunity for you to release that information, but also get a monopoly on the use and usage of that information for a time being. The idea and the reason behind patents is that this is such a good idea that the trade secret is so important, so valuable to society at large that the, the, the governing body wants to make sure that other people have access to it. Other people can use it, but not necessarily immediately because we want to uh, encourage people to publish patents, but also reward them for the work, the effort, and the research that they have put into it. And that's the reason why there is this monopoly for, uh, for a beginning part, which means that either the person who uh, created and filed the patent can use the technology behind that patent, the idea behind that patent, or they can license it out to others as well. Now, in general, open source licenses, which we will talk about in a little bit, are somewhat silent on the topic of patents and what they may or may not convey as far as patents are concerned. Uh, we'll discuss this in a little bit more detail when we go into the ins and outs of open source licenses, but this is something to consider. The third form of intellectual property are trademarks or service marks. These are basically the brand behind a, a company, a project, a product. These are the things that they are known by. These can be uh, logos, you know, the actual graphics that when you look at it, you immediately know uh, the company or the product that's being offered, a, a slogan, the name of, a, uh, of an entity. This is basically the way that most people are aware of them. This is the item that uniquely identifies them from their uh, competitors and their uh, competition out there. Now, it's important to recall that, again, in most cases, in fact, almost all cases that I know of, open source licenses do not convey trademarks. Um, most open source licenses and free software licenses out there do not give you uh, permission to use the trademarks associated with an open source project as part of the permission to actually use the project itself. And again, we'll talk about a little bit more in, in a few minutes when we talk about open source licenses. But in general, either the uh, licenses are silent about how they use trademark or explicitly forbid you from using the trademark. You know, that they are explicit in stating that this license does not give you permission to use those. And the reason behind this is that in many cases, the trademark, the brand of an open source project 
is most probably its most important asset since the other aspects of intellectual property are being given away, so to speak. The brand is something which is incredibly important to, uh, to maintain and to monitor and to take care of. And so you'll see in many, many cases, a um, license or a permission to use a trademark is a second uh, or additional document. It's something which may or may not be available for to use by a, a separate legal agreement from the Open Source Foundation or the Open Source Project. But you will also see that open source communities protect their trademarks very, very rigorously. Because as I said before, it is in many ways their most important asset. Now, one thing to, uh, to consider when we're talking about trademarks is that in general, there are two uh, particular uh, formats of trademarks. These are the generalized uh, trademarks and the registered trademarks. Uh, the registered trademarks are the ones with the icon here on the right, the, uh, the R with the circle uh, around it. Uh, these are trademarks which have been actually registered uh, by the person who owns the trademark to some governing body who has the responsibility to be the register of these, these trademarks. A registered trademark provides you, as the trademark holder, more protection should someone um, come against you as part of a trademark infringement uh, suit. Basically, this is someone who would be coming to you and saying, we own that name, you are using it, you are causing confusion in the uh, community out there. Uh, they're mistaking uh, your software or service with ours, and we're going to sue you because of that. A registered trademark actually has a date of filing, a date of registration. And so if you can show that you were using that uh, before they were, then that would, in general, make that case frivolous and they would throw it out. And that was one of the reasons why many cases do go and register, take the time, trouble, finances to go ahead and register their trademark formally and officially. Now, you don't have to do that. Uh, you can just use it as common use, in which case it really makes sense to, next to anything that you consider a trademark, uh, put at least the TM uh, next to it. Uh, you can't put the R with a circle on it unless it's actually uh, officially registered, but by putting the TM associated means that you are conveying to the external community that, yes, I am using this as a trademark. It's not officially registered, but that is the way I am using it. That is the way I am protecting it. And it does provide you a little bit more protection, again, in cases where any kind of suits of copyright, not copyright infringement, of a trademark uh, infringement. Uh, would uh, come to bear. Now, the fourth type of intellectual property is the one that most probably most people are familiar with. with. It's the one which uh, directly is involved in various open source licenses and the free software license. Uh, in fact, the whole idea of copyleft licenses, which you may have heard of, which are the product and result of the free software movement and the free software foundation, is because it is sort of like the antidote of, of copyrights. And the idea of copyright is that this is a, a, an artistic work which I own and restricts other people from reproducing it to building on top of it without my express permission. Uh, that is something which you don't have to declare. At the very instant of creation, a, a, a new work, a, um, you know, an artistic piece of work is immediately copyrighted by its creator. So you don't need to register something with the Copyright Office, for example, for it to be under copyright. 
just by simply creating it, it is under copyright. And as I said, copyright is designed to really restrict, to limit what people can do with it. And the whole idea of open source and free software is that we want to allow certain usages, certain things that copyright restricts, we want to allow, we want to open up, we want to uh, reverse that a little bit. And so open source licenses and free software licenses are all about this change, about making things available that copyright would uh, necessarily uh, close down and prevent you from using in ways that we would want to. So some of the, the goals of the various forms and flavors of open source licenses out there are, well, basically, as I said, one main thing is to remove at least some of the restrictions of copyright, but also many are written to enable and ensure what remains free and what remains open in the software that you are releasing out there. So for example, most um, copyleft licenses, and we'll talk about exactly what copyleft licenses, uh, less, uh, licenses are a little bit later on, most of those want to ensure that once a piece of work a piece of code is free, it always remains free. That there's no way that people can close it, for example. Um, you know, other licenses just want to say, hey, you know, if I'm giving you something, it needs to be free. You need to be able to use it. But what you do with it after you have it, it doesn't matter to me. These are some of the considerations on how to draft an open source license is determining how long something stays free and open as far as the intellectual property, the copyright, the uh, usage of that uh, project or code is, is done in the community. Another thing that uh, open source licenses are designed to uh, control in some way is the control of the project, the control of the code. Uh, again, some of these ways of drafting an open source license makes it easier for a particular uh, company or entity to maintain a high level of control and authority over an open source project, whereas others are more suited towards uh, really removing themselves from the control from saying, you know, uh, we are allowing as many people to do whatever it is they want to do, and it's really not up to us to control, manage, or direct how the, uh, the project in the code goes on. Other open source licenses are really ide ideally suited to create uh, and implement uh, open protocols and open standards. In fact, you'll see things that um, are specifically designed to allow a certain project or an implementation of an uh, open protocol to become a reference implementation, something that other implementations can be measured against, can be validated against. Uh, and by having this reference implementation available in an open source way, in an open source license, it in one way allows people to reuse specific sections of the code which implement those open protocols, but it also is another way of um, providing a baseline and a guideline and really a, um, a reward system in a way for you to not use the, your own implementation or to create something which is against the open protocol or the open standard. By having these reference implementations, it provides a known open and transparent form of stability against whatever that open protocol and open implementation is. And finally, uh, you can also talk about uh, open source standards that, uh, I mean, open source uh, licenses that help create an industry standard. Uh, they're designed to make a specific technology, a specific piece of software uh, ubiquitous within the tech structure 
inside there. And one way of doing that is having an incredibly robust, reliable implementation, but also having such an implementation available under an open source license in a way that encourages usage and contribution, which is with as few restrictions as possible as well. And we'll talk about which licenses may be ideally suited towards all these cases when we start talking about the individual licenses themselves. Now, as far as what constitutes uh, an open source license or a free software license, uh, there are two main uh, bodies and entities which determine this. Uh, the first is the Free Software Foundation, which has three freedoms, which a license much uh, must comply with to be considered a free software uh, license. Um, for open source, uh, the Open Source Initiative, OSI, are the keepers, the stewards of the open source definition. And there are basically 10 criteria that a license must abide by to be signified as an open source license. Uh, and again, uh, as a bit of an offside, um, if something really isn't, at least in my opinion, validated by uh, the open source initiative as an open source license, it really isn't an open source license. It can be open source like or something like that. But as we'll talk about a little bit later on, be careful when you look at software that you may want to contribute to or consume or leverage in some way and make sure that the license that it's under is actually an OSI approved license. Now there are, as I said, the Free Software Foundation has uh, three, four freedoms that a license must abide by. The uh, Open Source Initiative has its 10 criteria, but I think in general, open source licenses are really meant to provide three promises between the person or the entity creating, releasing the software and to the people who are on the receiving end of that. And the first promise is the promise to be able to use that software. Use that software in any way, in any fashion that you would want to use. Uh, one of the great uh, analogies or metaphors that I use is comparing the idea of, you know, source code and the applications with cookies or biscuits, the edible kind, and the recipes associated with using that. Um, you know, say, for example, that, um, you know, how useful would a recipe book be if you could read the recipe book? You could read the recipe of a fantastic cake or a fantastic cookie, but you weren't able to do it. You weren't able to actually cook the food item that the recipe talked to you about, okay? Well, in some ways, that's what copyright, uh, if, if a software is under copyright, that would prevent you from doing that. So one of the main promises is that you can use the source code that we're providing you in a way which makes sense. You can either, you know, use it and run it. Uh, you can use it for the, um, you know, intended purpose, of the uh, of the source code of the project or for a different prop or for different usage it really doesn't matter but the ability for you to actually use what is being published is a major promise that's being made another promise is that in addition to using what you are given you are able to modify it you are able to improve it you are able to um, change it for your individual use case for example Again, using the uh, the recipe um, and the uh, cookie or cake uh, analogy, you're able to, uh, you know, say you want um, to add the chocolate chips to a uh, recipe that you have that just does peanut butter cookies. Well, you're able to modify that. You have that permission. This is the same way with software. You are able to add functionality, add features. Uh, this is a promise that an open source license uh, gives to you as the end user. And finally, the third promise is that you're able to share. You're able to share the original source code that you were given. You are able to share your modifications either by themselves or in conjunction, in, in, 
in, uh, in, in integration with the original source code. You're able to change your modified version of it. You're able to give it out to other people as well. The software just doesn't go from the, uh, the person who's releasing the software to you. You now have the option to be someone who releases software in and of itself again. You are not the end of that chain. You can, if you choose to be, be someone who now is a contributor, a releaser, a distributor of software. And so those three promises, I think, form the basic of any good open source and free software license out there. Now, there are three main license types. Um, there are a huge variety of open source licenses. Last I checked, it was like 60 or something like that. It's a huge number. But I think if you look at um, the similarities between them, there are three main cases, three main flavors of open source licenses out there. Uh, the first is the very permissive give me credit license, which basically says you can do anything you want with this open source project out here, this, uh, this software that I'm giving you. You just can't claim that it's yours. But anything else you want to do is, is fine. You can go and use it any way you want. Some of the most uh, known permissive licenses out there is the, are the, um, the BSD licenses, the MIT license, uh, and of course the Apache license V2, ALV2. These are the uh, least restrictive and most permissive out there. And these are very, very popular licenses for use by uh, companies and organizations uh, because they really don't have to worry all that much about any sort of legal compliance issues when they use these uh, software projects which are under permissive licenses. Now, the second type of open source license are what I call the weak copyleft licenses or the give me fixes license. Uh, again, uh, this allows people to use and download the, uh, the software and modify it however they want. But if you take that software and you change it and then you uh, redistribute that software to other people, you have to publish your fixes. Um, you are required to, in some way, let people know what it was you changed, modified, deleted, uh, improved in the original project. So that way they can either, you know, use your modifications or not, but you have to make those changes available. The idea being that, hey, since you were giving something and you found it useful and you improved it or changed it in some way, it's only fair that you allow other people to benefit from the changes or the improvements that, uh, that you made to it when you distribute the software out there. Some of the best known examples of the weak copyleft licenses are the Eclipse uh, license, the Mozilla license, and the LGPL, the lesser GPL uh, license out there. It's not library GPL, it's lesser uh, GPL. But then again, these, um, these just say that all you need to do is release your fixes, your modifications out there in the same license that I gave you the original uh, software. And the uh, third and final main flavor of open source licenses would be uh, the strong copyleft, which basically says that because I gave you a piece of software under this particular license and you did something to it, you added to it, modified it, uh, you know, anything at all, um, and you redistribute it, you gave uh, this change version to, to somebody else, you need to give me everything. You need to release everything that is associated or comprises that larger work under the same license that I provided you the original work. So this sort of stickiness is why some people call these types of licenses um, for example, the GPL, the AGPL, uh, some people call them viral. I don't really appreciate that format because it has a, a negative connotation about it. But I do understand the, the rationale behind that because it does make people immediately understand 
that the, um, the license itself sort of like attaches to the code and you can never get rid of that code out there. Um, now these are all very, very weird, um, you know, somewhat hard to understand differences between the two. And again, going back to that uh, analogy metaphor about uh, cookies, biscuits, and uh, recipes, I'm gonna to try to give you a little information about how these differences play out in, in real time, in, in, uh, in the real world, in action. Um, and for this example, I'm using uh, an Oreo cookie. I don't know if everyone is familiar with that, but these are the cookies that have the, the top and bottom of the cookies are like, you know, chocolate, uh, cookie biscuits, and inside is this white uh, creamy center. In fact, it's the, the thing that makes an Oreo cookie uh, famous is the creamy filling. Now, just say, for example, that the company that creates the Oreo cookie, Nabisco, used open source licensed recipes for this. So let's see how it would interact with the, you know, permissive, weak copyleft and strong copyleft situation. Now, in a permissive, um, you know, ALV2, BSD type license situation, if the actual cookie part itself, the biscuit part itself, was under a permissive license and um, the Bisco used it uh, as to create their Oreo cookie and just say they needed to modify it, they needed to, I don't know, change the recipe in some way to make it easier to manufacture or make it easier for that uh, stamping, or the, it's got a little embossed stamp on the top and bottom of it to make that hold better in the production process. Well, by releasing the Oreo cookie, all they would need to do and say to be compliant with these licenses and say, hey, the original recipe for the cookie part of the Oreo cookie came from this open source project uh, out there. Um, but the changes that they made to that recipe don't have to be released to the public. And certainly the recipe for their secret Oreo filling doesn't have to be released as well. That can still stay proprietary. That can still say a trade secret inside of there. Now, if, for example, the actual cookie recipe itself was under a weak copyleft license, say the Mozilla license, uh, and again, they made those same exact changes just to the cookie recipe, you know, but not, of course, not touching the, uh, uh, the filling recipe at all. They just changed the cookie recipe. Then what they would need to do when they distribute the Oreo cookies to the mass market is say, hey, you know, we got the original uh, cookie recipe from this, uh, from this open source project, which is under the uh, Mozilla's public license. Uh, we made these changes. We are also releasing these changes under the Mozilla public license as well. But as far as, again, the recipe for the cream filling, they don't need to release that. They just need to release uh, whatever changes and modifications they made to the original recipe, the original code that they used to create a larger work. Now you consider this with the strong copy left with the AGPL or the GPL license, the situation is drastically different. In this situation, not only would they need to release the, you know, their changes under a GPL license, but because the cookie part is an, is an important primary part of the larger derivative work, which is the actual Oreo cookie itself, the GPL would require them to release the recipe of the creamy filling under a GPL license as well. They would no longer be able to keep that secret or a trade secret or proprietary or anything at all like that because the cookie itself, the actual Oreo cookie, the, the final work, the final product depends on something which is GPL. That means everything inside that final product must also be available under GPL. And so this is one of the reasons why it's called viral in nature. Uh, as you can see, this opens up a lot of questions and issues as far as, you know, well, how important is that cookie product? Uh, what would be, you know, for example, what would happen if uh, instead what we did is we released a kit, 
that provided a little dish of the cream filling and the two biscuits. And when you got the Oreo, you would have to go and scoop out the, the cream filling, you know, put it between the biscuits and make it yourself. Well, yeah, we're intending you to use the Oreo with, you know, the cream filling and milk, but we're not distributing that way. Those are the kinds of questions. Those are the kinds of issues that make people tend to avoid GPL and strong copy left license because those kinds of answers can only really be found out in litigation. And so that's the reason why most people kind of shy away from GPL um, and lean towards uh, permissive licenses out there. Uh, for me, I think each license has a valid goal. I do not uh, um, recommend at all not using GPL or AGPL in cases where it's defined, but those are the differences. And those are definitely the considerations to use if you are a developer, if you are someone who's creating an open source project and you see something, a, a third party project that you want to use in your software, you have to think about that. You have to think about these, these interactions um, out there. Now, there are some governance models for open source projects which are better suited towards one type of project. For example, uh, a walled garden kind of governance model where a, a company or an entity wants to maintain really tight control over a project uh, about who can contribute, who can use it, who can release it and things of that nature. Uh, they tend to uh, move and um, you know, want uh, strong copyleft licenses uh, out there. There are other types of open source governance models and projects which are under uh, the Benevolent Dictator for Life, the BDFL. Um, of course, the Linux kernel is a, is a great a example uh, of that. And there's not really one license which is best suited for, uh, for that for another. And there is the third type of governance model, which I call the true meritocracy or duocracy or whatever uh, term you want to use. But this is one which is really focused on building a large collaborative consensus based community around that with no real, um, you know, specific leader or, um, you know, oligarchy you know, behind it or things like that. And in general, these kinds of projects are more successful the more permissive the licenses are. Because again, um, it ensures that um, there is this, uh, it's more difficult for uh, an entity or person to claim control over a project if there is no preferred position or preferred ownership of the code. Whereas, uh, you know, strong copy left does lend itself to a, a situation or area where it could be abused to have a preferred owner or a preferred, uh, you know, maintainer or developer or contributor out there. Uh, in the remaining time that I have, I want to go over some uh, some additional thoughts that you may have regarding intellectual property uh, and open source. Uh, one thing I do want to um, specify is that in all of those cases that we talked about, you know that they all refer to copy, uh, copyright. None of them mention anything else. There is one license which is explicit as far as what patents are concerned, and that is the Apache license. It specifically has a patents clause inside of it. Uh, for the most part, other licenses out there are quiet or silent as far as patents are concerned. Now, there is some debate on whether there is an implicit uh, patent clause um, because there is no explicit patent clause. But again, uh, if patents are important to you, I would uh, invite you to look at the, uh, the Apache license uh, and as well seek out legal counsel. Sometimes you'll see open source projects available under dual licensing. Um, in general, most of these are used as a way to encourage people to pay for software uh, that uh, is released under open source. So in general, you'll see the dual license under a commercial proprietary license and what is perceived as a um, unattractive, uh, strong copyleft license like an AGPL. Again, the idea behind, behind that is that uh, they're basically playing on people's aversion to strong copyleft 
and it's like, well, I don't want to take the risk. I'll just pay for a license out there. Um, sometimes you'll also see um, projects under dual licenses, which are like, you know, a combination of a permissive license or a, um, you know, we copy left license. Again, I don't understand that. Sometimes that's for historical reasons, for example. But in general, most people will, you know, because they have the choice, choose the more permissive form inside of it. Um, but in general, I would say avoid dual licensing as much as you can if you're someone who's creating one from scratch because it does add to the confusion. And really, at the end of the day, when you're releasing something as open source, you want people to use it, consume it, um, you know, as, as easily as possible with as few questions as possible. So if you can use a well-known license, um, that really helps out. And by avoiding things such as dual nature and things like that, or additional clauses on top of it, um, you reduce the risk to using your software out there. Uh, as I mentioned before, there is not a one size fits all license out there. There's not one best open source license. Licenses are a tool and there are correct licenses for projects and incorrect licenses for projects. A lot of the issues that we've seen in the open source ecosystem lately have been, um, you know, basically companies releasing something under open source and choosing a license which was not suitable for how they wanted to leverage or, uh, you know, commoditize the software that they're releasing. Uh, they didn't spend enough time looking at the impacts and the interactions of the open source license they're using to how they are doing business. Uh, so really consider that. Consider how you want to, um, you know, release the software, how you want people to use it, and pick the right one out there. Um, make the wise decision. Don't just point, um, don't just choose an open source license because it's the first pull down you know, in the GitHub menu or because, you know, you heard of this license and other people like it. Make wise decisions because changing from one open source license type can be incredibly difficult. Um, it could require, for example, uh, contacting everyone, whoever uh, contributed a contribution to your software project, uh, making sure they are okay with relicensing to a different license. So really make the wise decision at the very, very beginning. Um, is it really open source? As I said before, there are some um, software projects out there uh, that pretend to be open source, but are not under a valid open source license. Again, just because something is available under GitHub does not mean it is necessarily open source. Look for the license file. Sometimes it's called a copying file, but look for those files. Make sure it's uh, OSI approved. Make sure the people haven't added any kind of additional clauses or amendments to the to the uh, license to uh, to make it different, to make it non-compliant. Um, and open source is not a business model. Uh, open source can help define your business model. But the idea of, hey, yeah, we're a, an open source, um, you know, uh, um, th that our business model is open source, is an open source license, really doesn't doesn't make any sense. And, and again, what we've seen lately are some companies that made this confusion, made this misconception and have paid for it because they've had to, after the fact, uh, change their licenses, move away from an open source license to something which is open source like um, to the detriment of the reputation and to the detriment, in my opinion, of the, um, you know, the usage of the software they're trying to uh, release. Because in many ways, compliance between license types is most probably the, the biggest thing to consider when you're using, contributing, and leveraging open source out there. So really take time to ensure that you understand at some level all these ins and outs of intellectual property, uh, how it affects uh, the open source projects that you're using, that you're contributing to, that you are uh, consuming, and make sure that you're compliant with all the conditions and regulations inside of there. Um, I'm available on... Um, uh, Twitter, as well as Mastodon. So feel free to follow me, uh, jimjag at mastodon.social and jimjag at uh, Twitter. Uh, I'm also on LinkedIn as well. Uh, 
I really thank everyone for sitting in and listening to the presentation. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Be more than happy to answer anything that I can or point you to someone who may be and most probably is more expert than I am. I hope you enjoy the rest of your time at uh, FOSS Backstage. And I want to thank the uh, people, the organizers of FOSS Backstage for inviting me. Uh, and providing me the opportunity to present this session. Thank you.